same chick, you never know how many are going to show up. <laughs> but it's good to see friends here, Mary and all of you. It's just, uh, and I don't know, um, I, how many know Pearl? You know Pearl? Yeah. Pearl Schick? Uh, she's at the Edgewood. I, I always greet, greet her and she's not doing very well right now. So anyway. Um, let's take, take a time to pray to the Lord for this time of in the Word. And I'll be honest today, I had so many sermons come. You know how that goes? They just kind of pop up in your head. Now which one do I pick? <laughs> um, well, it's the Word of God is what I want to talk about today. So let's just pray. Father, as we open your word today, we pray that your Holy Spirit would bless this presentation of your word. Uh, it's not the presenter himself or herself. It's the one who guides and directs us, our Lord Jesus. May he be present among us through the Spirit. And Lord, today speak to us and teach us as we celebrate such a wonderful event as a dedication of a child in the presence of a loving family, church family, extended family, those that have prayed for this little one even before she was born. We thank you, Lord. May the prayers continue as she grows. And may we remember the example set before us by our own Savior, Lord Jesus, and the warnings he gives us in the Word. Amen. This morning, uh, I want to present a word from Matthew chapter 18. Um, I settled on that kind of reluctantly because <laughs> there's so many things that you could talk about. I didn't figure you didn't want me to preach from kiver to kiver this morning. <laughs> that would take a long time. But I do found, I have found a passage and I want to tell you a little story about this chapter. This is a very precious chapter in Matthew's gospel to me. Because many years ago, one of my best friends in seminary, who was a Navy chaplain at the time, had a daughter he named, his second daughter he named after our oldest daughter, Rachel. And um, he had been home on furlough. We'd met in Anderson uh, for our uh, convention that year. And we kind of caught up with each other, you know how that goes. And he went back, he was serving on the John Kennedy at the time. And he was over, it was over in Israel, and uh, he, he was in the, on that voyage, and he got notice that Rachel had contracted a, a very a swift moving illness and had passed, had died. She was about, I think, three years old, and he called me and asked me to do the memorial. And we had just brought my youngest daughter home from the hospital after she had some problems. She was at the uh, uh, neonatal care unit in uh, Kalamazoo for several weeks before we got her back. And I went, I remember Rick going in over her crib and praying over her crib and saying, Lord, please let this child come home. And so with great difficulty, I went to Michigan where my friend was from and preached a sermon for something I would rather have done anything else but that. We just don't know. Life is so mysterious sometimes and God doesn't always make sense when we're going through the terrible trials that we all have to face at some point. Uh, whether it's a, a car accident, you know, we didn't make plans that day for that. But there it was. And uh, I'm glad the Lord was riding with you, Josh. So. Matthew 18. Let's just look to the scripture. Chapter 18, verse 1, NIV. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth. Unless you change and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. 
And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for that one wandered, that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did, did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. We live in a brutal time. We live in a broken time. We live in a time when you scratch your head and say, what else can go wrong in this place that I thought would be a safe haven for my family, my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren? I was uh, at a prayer retreat this past week, and I talked with a superintendent of schools from one of our uh, Pennsylvania districts, and she was saying that the hardest, the most difficult task she has every day going in as superintendent is seeing how children come to school with nothing to eat, no one's tending to their needs, Some, sometimes they have, don't have the right clothing. She told a story about a young man who was a football player. He was an older child, now he's playing football in high school. Wonderful kid. He said he showed up with a bag of hot curl, corn curls, what do they call those, uh, cheetahs or Cheetos or whatever. He said, that's my supper. She said, what? His mother uh, passed away and his father, I think, is trying to raise him, or vice versa, it might have been the father has passed and the mother's trying to raise him. Doesn't have much. They're poor people. But not so poor that he has to go hungry if someone was there to help him. So she said, I don't ever carry much cash. You know, it's the, we're, we're, live, we're, we have, we're in a public school system. That's what she said. So I gave him what five dollars I had. I said, please get something to eat for yourself before you go to practice. And then recently, just yesterday on the news, I don't know if you saw it, these two little children, a six-year-old and a two-year-old, were out in freezing temperatures. A bus driver, local area bus driver, saw that those two children walking in, into a dangerous area in the intersection and stopped her bus and went and got those kids and got them on the bus and put her own coat on the little girls. She was only clad in a t-shirt and a diaper. She was two years old. The brother was six. They, they found out later that they, they, the mother was gone, the father was gone, grandmother was supposed to be watching them, but she was in the basement and they didn't know where she was, so they walked outside and started walking down the street. <laughs> was, you know, they didn't know. But all I'm saying is this world is not a safe place for children anymore. And the saddest thing in the world is the womb is no longer a safe place for a child. The mother's womb. So when we have little ones and they're born and we, we anticipate them, sometimes they surprise us. <laughs> we, may, we don't always make the plan, you know. Someone else is planning sometimes. But when we determine that God has given us a child and determined to have that child and to bear that child and to give that child a name and to raise that child, we better be bringing the Lord into it. This is a hard life. 
And they're going to need all the help they can get. As we all well know. Amen? So I would call this message today the first children's sermon. Now notice what Jesus' disciples ask. And this, this seems to be the concern of adults. Uh, we we kind of watch what's going on in Washington and just I, I, I just shake my head and walk away and I pray, Lord, help those people find something to do except destroy each other. Please. Because you know it's going to set a pattern. Uh, it seems to be uh, retribution. When, when we take out our wrath on somebody else, someone else eventually gets even or tries to. Right? The Bible says that wrath, the, the wrath of man does not accomplish its, its wishes, its desire, which is justice. Only God will achieve that for us one day. And you have to have faith to believe that. So it's better not to let the wrath of man devour us. And then to have that joy of what we think will be justice getting even. Jesus says very plainly here, as they ask among themselves, together, they're asking together as that, that first group of disciples, what was their concern? A question. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And what did Jesus do? What was his example? You tell me. What, what did he do? He went and found what? Who? A little child. And he brought that child to the attention of all of those adults who were so worried about how great they were going to be. I was reading a commentary on this and it said something to the effect that, you know, if you read through Matthew, you'll see how prominent Peter was. Peter was beginning to exercise his, his uh, prominence early on and everybody in the 12, they, they knew that Jesus liked Peter and seemed to favor Peter, James and John. They were his three favorites. If you look, read through scripture, right? What the rest of them? What do you think a lot of their conversation was about? Look at that, Peter. Every time Jesus does something, he opens his mouth. You know how it is. A yeah, little bit of tinge of jealousy there. That, that happens in families too. Don't tell anybody. Right? And so this human thing we've got in us that wants to be exalted, that wants to be placed first, that want, Jesus was dealing with that and he took this little child and he says, this is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. This. This little child. But then he gives some very serious warnings and I just want to kind of reflect through this a little bit. I'm not going to try to preach all day or anything. I did take my watch off. And you know that means when a pastor takes his watch off it doesn't mean anything. Just that it's uncomfortable. <laughs> Alright. He says I tell you the truth. Verily, verily with the King James language. Truly, truly I say unto you. Unless you who? Now who's he talking to? Listen. Who's he talking to? The disciples. Right? unless you change and become like little children. We all know children aren't perfect. We all know that they're little sinners growing up to be big sinners until they find a savior and acknowledge. We dedicate them so then we can what? Train them up in the way they should. The way they should. You, I like it when you talk back to me. The way they should go. And they will not leave it in their old age. They, they, they won't walk away from it. That's the whole point. We want, to, we want to make the faith attractive for our children. Amen? And I remember a story Mary told me once. Mary, I remember this story. I remember a story you told me about you and Pete going to church late. Remember that story? I want to make sure she hears this. And you know what? They got to church. The organ or the pianist had already started playing. And what did they do? Pete turned around and they walked out. He said, if we can't be to church on time, we're not going to come at all. The next time you were on time, weren't you? <laughs> the whole point, he was teaching the family that the things of God are important. And there's a lot of people in here that know that. Oh, I, I just... 
we've shared so many things that, that, that stuck in my mind. <laughs> but th the things of God are not incidental. This superintendent, when she was talking at this meeting uh, we had, she said, was talking about how the schools have become such a, a, a dangerous place. She told about how someone visited her one day in her office, some strange car pulled up, and they put the school in lockdown. This person, she said, I'm sorry, you can't leave until after they, they say it's, it's clear. She said, every day it's like walking into a war zone. You think our schools need prayer? She took a day off. She's also a pastor, by the way. She took a day off, and she says, I had to be here today. We need the prayers of the people. You realize that? School leaders need our prayers. Teachers need our prayers. Wonderful teachers are resigning from teaching because they have to do social work now instead of being able to teach. Because families are not being families. They're not taking responsibility for these little lives they bring into the world. Jesus said, that's not a good place to be with the Father. And so he says, therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. <laughs> Put that in your memory banks, friends. The next time you're tempted to do something mean and hateful and spiteful against somebody that's a child of God, maybe a, or a family member, or a... You know what I mean. It's easy to do. I, as as I've, been, I've told you before, I've, the church, we, I've been here a couple times, so I've told the story about dealing with our aging parents now. My mom died in May, and Dad's up at Edgewood right now for temporary... But he's been at our house. It's a whole new thing, and, and I, it, it creates a whole new tension between siblings. And, I, and I'm trying to navigate that as a believer. I'm the oldest. You know, it's tough. It's tough. We're tested by things all through our life, but our God promises to be with us if we don't let ourselves get vengeful and mean and, and uh, spiteful. Those are the things that families have to fight against. And they can't fight as a group thing. It's individuals and families need to be on their knees in the presence of the Lord, praying for the Spirit of God to unite the family in the love of Christ. Churches are the same. A church is nothing more than an extended family, right? And so often the things we get upset over are such small little tiny things and we let them become bigger than they really should be. Amen. So Jesus is challenging his disciples here with a simple example. You ask, I'm telling you, there's no way you can say that's too complicated for us to understand. Is it? Is that too complicated? I don't think so. They ask, he pulls a child out of the crowd, he says, here, this is greatness in the kingdom of God. A childlike spirit. Understand, and you know what he means by that is children know even if they're rebellious and angry as they get older and all the things that we we talk about the terrible twos and the tragic threes and uh, all those things uh, children are not easily taught or directed they have to be loved and nurtured we have to have patience they have to know that there are certain things that are costly if they if they go against that particular warning they're going to pay a price um, in a perfect society we could have cars that drive themselves and they'd be, they wouldn't have wrecks well in a really perfect society we could have people who would drive a car like they were threatening their neighbor if they went too fast or too slow or went through that red light even though oh, I gotta get there you know one time we were going down to the high school, a friend of mine who pastored in this area, we, were, had, we got donuts and, and uh, milk that for that morning, and we were pulling out the intersection right, right here, down here. And the light was green on our side, and I began to make that left turn from where I was coming, and didn't a car come right through that red light? And I'm telling you, if I would not have looked, we'd have been hit broadside. That's how it, you gotta watch. 
Because human beings drive cars and they're lethal. And there's no laws against ownership of cars either. There should be. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. This is a warning. This is a warning. Now Jesus has taken a child, but he's, he's, he's enlarging the child. This is what we need to do too. Children are not insignificant. They're very important. Because in the children is, faced, is a future. Our hope is the future. And that child represents hope for older adults, right? I go up to Edgewood, and if you see a child, if, if you're ever there and you see it, someone bring in a child, those faces light up. When the churches go up and have a service, the faces just light up. They love to see children. Because it reminds them, as they hang around with each other waiting, I had one person tell me once, all I'm doing is here waiting to die. When a child comes in, it says to them, oh, there's still hope. There's still hope. There's a little one. My life has not been in vain. Can you imagine spending hours day by day just sitting in front of a television and, and watching the commercials and one thing after another, nothing really exciting. Same old, same old, whether you watch news or whatever, it's same old, the, the, the failures of, of human beings. I, I just see it over and over again, failures of human beings. And you're sitting there in your aged body that doesn't work like it used to and hurts where it shouldn't hurt and when, when you'd rather it not hurt and then maybe you just don't have any, my dad so often will say, I'm so weak today. So weak today. Weakness. That's why we need to honor our older loved ones and bring the children into their presence once in a while and let them bless the children. Let them put their hands on the children. And it's a sad thing the way that because of our culture being so scattered now, so many grandparents will tell me, I never see my grandchildren. They're always busy doing something else. I'm proud of them, but there's hey, don't forget the first order of business is the family and somehow make a way. It may be not as often as you'd like or as often as they'd like and maybe you get the guilt treatment. You know, that's a, that's a handy old thing for, for uh, kid, uh, older folks to do to their children. Oh, you know, you know how we do that. Manipulate. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about us honoring our loved ones. Olders honoring and loving the younger Younger, honoring, and loving the older. That's the best way. The way of Christ. Amen? So, he goes on then. And this, this is a very serious paragraph because he's warning the disciples not to harm anybody that the father calls his child. He's expanded the role of the child here to anybody, any one of us as human beings, we're children to God. We're his children. So if anyone causes any one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it'd be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe, now listen to this, woe to the world. Now we don't like the woes of God. We don't like that. Well, you know, shouldn't there be a more positive message today? Well, maybe it is positive if you get through the whole section. But this is not positive. This is, this is, this is a warning. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Which means the cause of sin can be found in things that we do or say or condone, right? Laws we make or laws we don't make or break. That can all damage people of God. And that's what he's talking about. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. If I'm responsible for damaging a soul... God holds that against me. That's why he warns preachers, you sure you're, you sure you're called to do this, it's going to be very, very costly. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, what do you do? Now some people take that literal. He's not trying to be literal, he's making a point. This is, this is metaphorical. It's better to enter life maimed and crippled than to have all of your limbs and Use it for sin. Let's face it. Our feet take us places we shouldn't go and our hands do things they shouldn't do. And our eyes see things we shouldn't watch. And that's what he's talking about. 
The example we're setting for our children by where we go, what we do, and what we see, and then what we talk about. The tongue is listed as a dangerous weapon in the book of James. Read it sometime. So after all of that, he says, it's better to be maimed and go to heaven than to be whole and go to hell. And I want to tell you something. Jesus talked about hell a lot. It's a real place, not God's preference for us, but he's warning us. Make the choice. Make the determination in your soul. You're going to follow Jesus. Because he's the only way. Uh, he told the disciples later on in John 15, without me you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. And then he says in uh, verse 10, see that you do not look down on any one of these little ones. We have a tendency to children, you know, kind of put them in a little, they're little, we don't listen to it. They don't understand what we, we've lived longer. We know more. We've experienced more. How, about, how many have ever said it's not my first rodeo? Right, not my first rodeo. When you go through experiences, but then a little child comes along and maybe has questions or doesn't understand all that, and we tend to kind of belittle them and put them in that, that place, you know. Jesus is saying, don't underestimate the importance of the questions of a child. How would you have liked to have been Jesus' mother and father and having him asking you questions? You ever think of that when he was growing up? I think Jesus grew up just like we do and he had a lot of questions. Of course, he had a father in heaven that knew all the answers too, right? But do you think Joseph knew all the answers to the questions he might have asked him? Or Mary? But, but it says he submitted himself to them and grew up. We don't know much about him uh, from the age of 12 on to the place where he came out at 30 into the mini his ministry. But we know enough to know that he submitted himself to Joseph and Mary as a child. And he was a precocious child. Right? He should have been with them as they were leaving Jerusalem that one time, remember? And all of a sudden, what did they discover? He wasn't there. How'd you like to lose the Son of God, friends? <laughs> I don't think I would. And so they go looking for him and they find him. Where'd they find Jesus? In the candy shop? No. He was at the temple sitting with the elders and he was discussing the law with them and asking questions that they couldn't answer. He, he had a destiny. Didn't you know, he said, I must be about my father's business. Joseph goes, wait, I'm a carpenter. Oh, I get it. His father. And his father's business, I'm going to conclude here, his father's business was to send him to a garden where he prayed and sweat great drops of blood. Where he wrestled through in that garden and defeated the enemy who would have stopped him. If there's any other way if there's any other way, Father, do it. I don't want to go through this. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So Mary's baby, her teenage son, her adult son, the servant prophet of God, the Savior, took up a cross for you and me and little Hadley and every other little one in this place took up a cross and bore that cross to Calvary where he was nailed to it and tied to it between two thieves because he was innocent but took up on my sins and your sins if that isn't good news to tell a little girl I don't know what is if that isn't worth once in a while putting aside the junk of the world and saying, I'm going to go give God some time in church today. I'm going to spend some time with God with a family of people that believe. If that isn't worth teaching your child how to pray a prayer in the home at before a meal or at bedtime. My dad, 92 years old, I still remember him coming into our room and saying our night prayers with us. 
And it was kind of a rote, you know, very rote, very repetitive. But he helped us say our prayers for our family to God. You think it's not important? It bears great fruit if you do it in the name of Jesus by faith in his wonderful love. And so that's what he's saying to these guys. He's saying, guys, you're my disciples. You've got to get this. Because if you don't get it, everybody else is going to get it wrong. If you want to be in the kingdom, you've got to be like a child and trust your father and your savior. Lord, may these words from my mouth and meditations of my heart be effective to enter the hearts of your people without damaging them or threatening them. May that improve all of us that we were here today to see this little girl be given to you, be given back to you, as uh, Hannah said, lent to you for life. May you bless her life, may you bless these, this family and all of the extended family and this family at First Baptist. May you bless and keep and watch over them. And may there be a, a, a new surge of love and energy and strength through the Spirit come into all of us because we've been here today to watch a little child be given back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. When a leader, 400.